I mean, we're not going to be here another billion years, are we? We're, we're done. We are racing towards extinction at a rate that is beyond anything I've seen. That's a big reason why there's so much intervention from non-physical beings and from extraterrestrial beings. Why is it that a lot of people think everyone else is a narcissist, but they're not? Because they don't recognize it in themselves. We recognize where we're being injured, but not where we're injuring. And that is the problem. So I'm wanting people to almost get into this Braveheart mentality at this point, where your own survival or the, you know, the survival of your species has to count less than your own personal vote. And what was the worst story that was perpetuated that wasn't true or really affected you? Essentially, I was gone after as a, as a very dangerous cult leader who leads people to commit suicide. Um, the future, what are you most excited about or most scared about? Our only answer now to dealing with AI is to master relationships. We got to start to behave in a way that makes it rational to keep us around. You're going to love this interview. So I ask you to support the channel. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on. Teal, does feminism and maybe now the world at large hate successful men? Yes. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Why? Why? Because of wounding. I mean, everything you're seeing within the feminist I don't even want to call it a movement anymore. It's a, it's a giant reaction to thousands of years worth of pain. And that pain is? Oppression. That pain is ownership, honestly. Um, if you look throughout history, men owned women. Women were considered property. I mean, for so long that what's happened here in the last three generations or two generations even is nothing. So for the majority of, of female life, a woman was owned by a man and ownership is an interesting concept because it can either be something that's a positive experience, if that ownership is a positive thing, or it can be a negative experience. When you're owned by something, <clears throat> your entire life experience is dictated by that individual. So is that a person who takes your best interests as a part of his own? Or is that a person who doesn't care about your best interests? It's all about his best interests. And unfortunately, that story has not been a great one for many women. And is there a, a meet in the middle? Is there a balance? Is there somewhere where we should have this equity that we talk about? Equity is an interesting concept to me because when people talk about equality, they like to equate it with sameness. And there is no such thing as sameness between men and women. We're like two different elements. So the, the place in the middle that you're talking about that we are meant to meet is when femininity is in its utmost state of power and masculinity is in, in its utmost state of power. What we find is a union between elements, not a competition, not a jockeying for resources and energy and position and power. And so if we've got this, let's say, backlash due to thousands of years of oppression um, through women being owned by men has it now gone too far where women feel pressure to be too much like men and not feminine anymore i honestly consider this to be the biggest shadow of the feminist movement of the 1960s is that it's not that women understood even what feminine power was because they did not have that i mean for thousands upon thousands of years that power was stripped away from them largely by religious institutions and government institutions because they had no connection with that definition of power, their only example for power was their fathers, the very people who had hurt them. So what we find in the 1960s is a glorification, not of feminine power, but of women essentially being able to do what men do and being just as good as men. And so it was a competition to be male, in fact. And, and even though you can look at the 1960s as this incredible step for you know, femininity into positions of more freedom, because quite frankly, before that, it was absolutely embarrassing. We lost a whole lot. We did not gain feminine power. In fact, we further demolished feminine power. Um, and now women have found themselves in a position where they're expected to be what a man is and provide what a man provides at the same time as somehow provide what a female provides. So it's, it's the era of the woman does everything. And what's the point of a man? That is destructive, not only for women, but for men. So right now we're living through a crisis, honestly in both masculinity and femininity because of it. So in some of my recent interviews, Teal, 
I've asked what is a man because I feel like that's the, one of the hardest questions to answer at the moment. And I'm going to answer it in a minute, but I've never asked this on my show before in nearly a thousand episodes, but now I have to ask it. What is it to be a woman? So when we look at, at femininity or masculinity within the greater universe, what you're looking at is polarities. So everything in the universe, in fact, everything, you could divide into one of these two polarities. So you could look at something like darkness as actually more feminine, light, more masculine, um, something like nurturing, right? More feminine, um, encouragement, more masculine. You could divide everything, everything like this. So a man or a woman is essentially the embodiment of this masculine or feminine energy. And each man or each woman is a different embodiment of those specific energies. You'll notice that certain men, for example, are, are much more strong in the embodiment of, of those qualities like leadership, whereas another man might be much stronger in a quality like encouragement. But there are all these qualities, both positive and negative, that fit into one or the other. So when we're talking about what a man is, we're talking about a, a masculine male embodiment that is the manifestation of these specific energies within the universe. And it's a big, long list. Masculine Masculine character traits or masculine qualities within the universe is a very long list. <laughs> Can you list some of them? Can we do the what is the man question? <laughs> okay, um, so leadership would be in there. Containment would be in there. Forward moving energy would be in there. Drive is in there. Um, intellect, whereas see the counterpart to that was wisdom, which is feminine. Intellect is masculine. God, I could be here all week doing this. <laughs> Uh, strength is a masculine trait. Um, expanse is feminine, see, which is why the, the capacity to bring in or take on more pain is actually, it belongs to the feminine side because there's two different approaches to pain, whereas strength is masculine. Okay, so we're at this really strange crossroads then when a, apparently we've had feminine oppression for thousands of years and now we've got an attack on masculinity. So it seems like both sexes are mm -hmm. yes both sexes are absolutely fucked <laughs> and but this if you if you look at human history which a person can't consider themselves truly aware without studying history you see this pendulum swing whenever there is extreme levels of pain experienced by a group of people they will take that pendulum and swing it all the way over to the opposite unhealthy extreme and that's what we're experiencing right now and I would dare say that this gets even more uh, damaging than what most people are looking at, because now, you know, you could look at the positive side of this LGBTQ community and the uprising there, but there's also a negative side to that too, which is when we're, when we're almost going more non-gender, you're also losing the qualities of both polarities, which are very, very potent and very strong and very needed in the world at this time. So, yeah, I mean, it's really not good right now that you're bringing up this subject which is honestly one of the biggest obstacles I think that we're facing, all of us, regardless of our gender. How many genders do you think there are? Me? Two. Two. I'm going to tell you there's absolutely two, just two genders. But I'm not going to say that everybody must fit into those two genders. When I talk about genders, it's simply looking at and acknowledging polarity within the universe. But it's not that people have to fit into either polarity if that's going to cause them pain or whatever. I'm in favor of healing. So for some person, healing may be to gravitate in the direction of any kind of combination of experiences in their life that involve certain character traits of one gender versus another gender. And it's, it's not a moral conversation for me. Okay. Um, so a friend and mentor of mine, John Demartini, he believes that um, we are perfect as we are, we are not broken in any way, we don't need to be fixed. And um, that sometimes confuses me because then, you know, you talk about healing and, and healing would assume there is something to be healed, therefore something is broken and needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And I have this dichotomy go on in my head all the time. I'm perfect as I am. No, I'm not. I'm fucked and I need to fix that, which is about me. Oh, but no, but I'm perfect just as I am. Does that go on in your head? And have you got any solutions for us? That doesn't go on in my head at all. Um, let me think about why it doesn't go on in my head. Okay, so from, from non-physical perspective, we have to take into account that which is beyond this life. 
as we are, right? You could judge that as in a state of perfection, whatever that means, because it's not like that aspect is is coming into this time space reality and is becoming defective. But we are two points of perspective. We're not just that non-physical aspect. We're also this physical aspect that we call by our name. That includes our ego, though. So I guess it goes beyond just physicality. For that temporal self that we are right now, there's many experiences that we can encounter that pull us out of alignment with that non-physical point of perspective, that pull us out of alignment from our preferred state of being. So there is no such thing as we're perfect as we are unless where we are is the preferred state of being. But if you look at the average person, their preferred state of being is not where they are and what they are doing. A hater of mine ended up doing a piece who unfortunately was taken up by the Daily Mail. And so it just started overnight. It was like bam, 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 poof, all the media channels. This is a nightmare person. Who judges the preferred state of being? The person themselves. But what if the person doesn't even know themselves? Or they then don't know what their preferred state then, of being is? Even if a person doesn't consciously know this on, on you know, on an intellectual level, they will still be emotional indications that they are not in their state of preferred being because they are not happy. So if a person is experiencing, I'm unhappy in this moment, whether it's because of some circumstance they're in or the thoughts they're thinking about those circumstances, they are in that moment out of line with their preferences. So are you saying then that the preferred emotional state is happiness? Yes. But doesn't happiness slow down and avoid progress and isn't it pain and struggle that creates progress and isn't progress evolution there are two sides of the same coin how <laughs> the unwanted what you're calling the struggle right the unwanted is what defines the wanted so we could consider the wanted state as the lotus that grows from the mud which is that unwanted state without the unwanted the wanted does not exist there is no expansion within this universe outside the context of that polarity so in that way, you could you could say that the unwanted or the struggle is what gives rise to happiness in the same way that it gives rise to the preferred state or the expanded state for the individual. But this is why I'm saying that happiness is so incredibly important and it is the preferred state, right? It's because the fact that we even feel that emotional system within ourselves so as to feel, oh, this I don't like, this I do like, this acts as a kind of guidance system where a person going for that state of happiness, going towards the preferred state, whether that's their thoughts, words, or actions, it brings them into the expanded state, into the improved state, into what's next, which is quite interesting for this universe, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so I think most people don't get what you've just said, because I think that most people want the preferred state of happiness, but they avoid the unwanted state of struggle to achieve the wanted state of happiness and therefore they're always avoiding happiness paradoxically that right there is what happens in an unawakened being i don't want to make it wrong because the majority of of beings who are incarnated on this earth are stuck in that cycle of instinct without that cycle of instinct we get ourselves in a lot of trouble so there's just a little bit of expansion happening with each being who is in that cycle that you're talking about what what really differentiates that pattern of instinct from an awakened being is that the awakened being says wait a minute it's almost in this observa observation state where it says okay i'm actually going to become conscious of this play between the unwanted and the wanted between struggle and pleasure i'm going to see the value in both and thus i'm going to mine both for information and with that information, I'm going to make a decision. You'll see a person in that state make a decision in favor of, of their preferences, but it comes from a place where they're not in resistance to the information that exists on the side of struggle. This is where you get into these Buddhist teachings of, of um, transcending samsara, samsara being that wave of suffering. Oh, happy and happy, happy and happy, right? Um, it's not that by reaching that state of transcendence or by awakening and awakening and awakening, you get out of the samsara cycle. What it is, is that your whole relationship to the waves of samsara change, that you're no longer subject to them. 
In fact, you may be choosing them consciously. And, and when we choose something consciously, whether it's choosing consequences or something like that, it changes the entire nature of the experience you have with them. So how do we become more awakened? By becoming enlightened. <laughs> by becoming, that's a whole, that's an order right there. That's a tall order. Um, by becoming aware of what you're not currently aware of. Um, okay, let's think about this. So the subconscious, right? Subconscious is really what you don't know that you don't know. To do that, you have got to have a looseness of perspective. You've got to be able to expand your own awareness past your own awareness. Now that can be something as simple as a compassion exercise where you pretend to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Or it could be something like, you know, the shamans do where they engage with psychedelic plant medicines to learn more about the nature of the universe or engaging in meditation or, 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 and this is where, where you've, it's almost like there's not one recipe for awakening. Every culture, every person who is, who is essentially offered a tool has brought a very powerful tool for awakening. So you, you've got such an arsenal to choose from of methods with which to expand awareness. It is out of this world. And it's not just limited to the spiritual field. Psychologists are doing this every day, you know, <laughs> how to see what's going on from a different perspective, how to disidentify with your ego. <laughs> it's a very long list, which is why it's a lifelong practice. It's not like this goal that you're getting to. And in fact, what, I mean, people usually start off being like, I want to awaken, but that, that goal is very quickly abandoned because it starts to become a better, it gets the better, it gets thing. Do you think that being able to observe your emotions almost as a third party observer, as opposed to being reactive to them, is a, at least a path towards being awakened or enlightened? Yes. Yeah, it's really, really important. But I mean, human beings have a very difficult time understanding emotions. Emotions are, are very abstract for the average person, when in fact it's your deepest source of personal truth. So underneath every single emotion is some kind of personal truth. If you're able to observe your emotion rather than just be swept up in it, you are able to identify what information that that emotion is conveying about your personal truth and thus act accordingly. Is the emotion giving you feedback on your personal truth or is it reacting to the environment in which you're in? Both. Both. Okay, so it's feedback to environment. Um, at, filtered through your life experience, something like that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could simplify it in that way. Yeah, I like to simplify things. I'm an entrepreneur. I like things simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you talked about ego. Is ego the enemy, like we're all told? Hell no. No, in fact, this is one of the things that bothers me the very most about the standard narrative about the ego. The ego is the single biggest vehicle for your own awakening. And the biggest lesson, honestly, which people seem to absolutely miss, regardless of whether it's with Christ and Lucifer or with uh, Buddha and Mara, is that the antagonist, essentially, is not really the antagonist, is the very fruit of the awakening itself. And that one cannot achieve a state of awakening without integrating, in fact, one's ego. The ego is infinitely beautiful. People need to fall in love with it instead of continue to treat it like an enemy. Does it have a shadow side? Of course it does. That's what we've been talking about for so many years. But there's no art without ego. That's something that people have to understand. There's, there's none of these beautiful things that you see in, in the world are possible without ego. Yeah, I mean, there's no great rock or heavy metal music, which in my genre, without ego. <laughs> yep. Maybe there's no progress without ego. Exactly. Hmm. So why is society or these wise um, Stoics made ego the enemy? Because they identify the shadow side of the ego as the source of suffering, and then it is only natural for them to want to get out of suffering. Um, I don't want to give people the impression that spirituality over the last thousands of years has been an integrated way of going about life. It's been an escape hatch. It's been an avoidance mechanism. Spirituality is one of the greatest human coping mechanisms that there is. And a coping mechanism by definition is not to create change, it's to adapt to a stressor. 
So there was so much suffering on, on this earth that people conceptualized of a better life outside of this, and that includes outside of the self. A state of selfhood, right? Which is what the ego is. The ego is literally nothing more than a self-concept. A self-concept, by definition, separates you from the rest of the universe, so you lack a sense of connection in it. So people who were looking at things like that thought, okay, the solution to this torment of separation is to get rid of the ego. Really, it's not to get rid of anything. In fact, if you're doing that, that's where you get to eventually. If you're pushing away your own ego, you're enhancing the separation. <laughs> so... The future, what are you most excited about or most scared about? Our only answer now to dealing with AI is to master relationships. You know, you're now dealing with this, this separate being which is fully capable of expanding thought at a rate that makes humans look beyond dumb. We are in disruptive financial times, interest rates going up, the banking system, the government, taxation. So I've created my digital financial freedom toolkit, a toolkit to help you save money in the right areas and scale and make money in the right areas. In the description and the comments below, you can find a link, go get it for free. People who are trying to disown a side or a part or push away or reject a pole end up attracting more of the thing they're trying to disown and reject and avoid. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Like, a fantasy of perennial happiness surely just leads to perennial unhappiness because there's no such thing as perennial happiness. <laughs> Whatever you resist persists. This is the there you go. Yes. I can tell you why if you'd like. Please, this yeah. This universe is, is governed by this law of mirroring. Many people call this law of attraction, right? And that means this is an inclusion-based universe, not an exclusion-based universe. You cannot think about the not of something. It's not possible. So if I'm, if I'm in a state of avoidance, like so let's say I'm thinking I've, I want to get away from a shark, I don't want to run into sharks, there is no not shark. There's only inclusion in an inclusion-based universe. And the law of mirroring simply reflects my thoughts. So if I'm thinking about no shark, I've actually picked shark as my point of focus. <laughs> and thus it amplifies. So the solution is? The solution to what? Not the not shark. It's not even having a concept of shark. Yeah, but you can't do that. <laughs> because solution... you have to have a concept of shark to have a non-concept of shark. It, yeah. Uh, what it is? So, I mean, what is it that you're identifying as the problem? And I'll tell you what the solution to that is. Like... The problem is polarizing yeah. or trying to reject, avoid, or disown yeah. a, a pole of something that I believe is whole. So, you said it. Okay, so you unwanted. Own... Here's the solution you own whatever is unwanted, you have to own it. So instead of instead of pushing it away, it it can't unexist. So if it exists, you bring it closer, you understand it, and you change your relationship to it. Right. So is that a part of healing then? Owning what happened and changing your relationship with it. Whether that's a part I, of you, I'm, I'm a good student. I'm getting this. <laughs> that's a part of yourself. Whether that is some trait in somebody else. Whether it's something external in the world. I mean, whatever it is. Yes. Okay. So you talked about healing, you referred to it earlier. Um, why do we all need healing? Well, if you're perfectly satisfied with your life, I wouldn't say that you do need it. But the majority of people are suffering their asses off. That's why you need healing. Isn't, su isn't suffering the unwanted to discover the wanted? <laughs> That's not the full picture of, of suffering. No. H hit me then. These are questions, they're not assumptions. <laughs> Hit you with the full picture of human suffering? Yeah. Human you got three minutes, go. <laughs> human beings have, have, have created a, a, a life for themselves and a society for themselves, which is not conducive to themselves as beings. Human, human beings have a very hard time accepting themselves as a species so as to understand the species that they are, so as to understand the underlying conditions of happiness for their species. So they're, they're perhaps the being on the planet that is turned against their own nature the very most. You cannot do that without causing such severe levels of suffering that you cannot have a thriving society. So a lot of the confusion around, you know, people being like, why are we so unhappy? The answer is because of a lot of decisions 
that took place throughout history for various reasons that pitted humanity against itself. And as a result, what you take as normal is absolutely a bastardization of everything that you need. From connection to the way your food is grown to everything. So the healing is needed so that a, a single child in the universe is able to step into a world where their needs are met and where their potential can in fact be actualized. Because the type of, of polarity that I've been describing to you, the type of unwanted versus wanted that has been experienced by humanity is not necessary for expansion. It's so extreme. So extreme that many people can't close the gap between where they are and what they want. And so they die. And that was not the way that it was meant to be played. So if humanity goes and creates a kind of utopia, there will still be enough contrast to create expansion. You don't need these deep levels of suffering. You're in fact thwarting expansion this way. So what are some, I would say basic or simple, though I guess they're not, steps that society would need to take to make it more conducive to allowing us expansion and realizing more of our potential? Well, first and foremost, the single biggest human need is connection. So that can't be something that's taken for granted. And knowing that the single biggest need for a physical human is connection, the entire process of birth <laughs> through a child's formative experiences with their caregivers would have to be completely different through the education, the experience of education, all of it. I mean, we would have to form our society around this, this experience of, of connectivity. Um, each being in this in the society would have to have multiple resources for that connection. I see that as the most important thing for humanity right now, because not having that turns human beings into an absolute mess, whether it's with addictions or psychopathic behavior, or I'm mean, going to stay here for a long time listing all of these things. Um, it's the root of mental illness, if you want to know the truth. So, that would be the first thing that needs to change. Um, second thing is we are woefully disconnected to this planet. We're living in synthetic, ex synthetic environments, which we were never designed to live in. Um, nature provides a kind of peace, which the human bio field needs desperately. And yet most of us live our life far above the earth. Therefore we cannot ground properly separated from all of the natural energies by metal and glass and concrete. You can't stay healthy that way. Um, next thing you'd have to do is change all of the, the ways that our food is handled and grown and everything. I mean, the way that we've gone about the food industry, honestly, in the last however many hundreds of years has, has become something which is so shocking, honestly. Most people don't understand how shocking um, from soil depletion. So the kind of nutrients you're able to take in from your food nowadays is nothing compared to what you could take in from like a, a basic potato you know, 100 years ago, all of that would have to change. That means our farming practices would have to change. Um, education around food would have to be something that is provided even to people who don't have, you know, the resources for it. And I mean, honestly, our entire system of priorities and values within government would have to change. We are still fundamentally more interested in maintaining empires and forging empires and resources for individuals than we are focused on the well-being of humanity. And this is something that's very difficult, honestly, to understand if you're not from this planet. I mean, when I can tell you that extraterrestrial beings or these beings that are not terrestrial based cannot understand why a species would have the amount of resources that they have, perfect amount of resources to take care of every member of their society and does not choose to do so. It's very confusing. So I have a few questions. Who are these extraterrestrial beings um, judging us on our ability to fuck ourselves? <laughs> They're beings who have an awareness level that makes it so they cannot separate from humanity. They, have, they see humanity as a part of themselves. We could consider this uh, an awareness that enters around the six dimensional frequency um, is where Honestly, you cannot see things as other, and you can't mistake the effect of one being on the whole web of existence. 
Therefore, a problem with people is a problem with the self. It makes no sense to sort of sit somewhere off in the greater universe when an aspect of you is suffering and to not answer to that suffering. But obviously there are some, there are some behaviors that those aspects of themselves right now, humans, are engaged in that are counterproductive and that are self-sabotaging, even though there is no such thing as self-sabotage ultimately, because every being is doing something, even if it is detrimental to themselves, because they think that the doing so is actually serving them. So that was a long-winded way of saying, essentially, in order for all this change, values have to change. Is this also a part of a problem being that we're inherently selfish? I don't actually think that a human being is inherently selfish. Okay. Many powerful people in the world acting selfishly. <laughs> yes, it's a byproduct of self selfish behavior, what we're calling selfish behavior, which is just uh, violent self-preservation. But a being only gets to that state of violent self-preservation when they have lacked the necessary connections in their childhood. Right. So, um, I read recently, just layering onto this, because um, I read recently that essentially one of the founding fathers of AI is experiencing a lot of remorse and regret um, and loss and fear that we've opened up Pandora's box uh, leading towards human extinction. And whilst I don't see myself as a, an extraterrestrial terrestrial being, I do often imagine myself as a non-human looking at humans going, we've got all these resources and we're just messing it all up. For example, we have this amazing vessel called a body, which if you use in the right way, it can grow in strength and size and speed. So you could basically be given a, a really small little car and turn it into a V12 supercar with divine gifts, but we mess it up. We put the wrong fuel in it and we, we don't nurture it, but we don't know how to use it. And no one tells us how to use it. And if there are people who tell us how to use it, then government control those people. I don't know. So I think this a lot, but basically what I'm saying is, are we pretty close to um, wiping ourselves out and becoming extinct? I mean, we're not going to be here another billion years, are we? We're, we're done. We are racing towards extinction at a rate that is beyond anything I've seen. Yep. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a big reason why there's so much intervention from non-physical beings and from extraterrestrial beings and, 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 and. Who is the greatest spiritual teacher and why? So fungus is actually the superior organism on this planet. If there are extraterrestrials that landed on planet Earth, humans wouldn't be the ones that they would be initially talking to as the most intelligent species. It's the fungus that they would be talking to. It's completely connected. I mean, it, it holds a state of connectivity within the web of life on Earth. How did we stand a chance though? If you think about you know, we're born, like you said, with this baby of pure infinite potential, and then we're stuck into this toxic society. By transcending our narcissism. I think this is really funny because, especially in my field, the sort of self-help spiritual field, the word relationship is such a trite word. It's the key to humanity's survival. Human beings are locked in a state of narcissism. A state of narcissism is ultimately where you are considering only the self and you are disconnected fundamentally from the entire web of that which is connected to you and that which you depend on. That narcissistic state of being is what is making us a match to all of those multitudes of different ways that we could become extinct. It is all because of that behavior. Here's what I mean by that. If we're fundamentally disconnected from our impact on the web which, with, which with we depend on environmentally, then we create a, very, a collapse of the very things that we depend on. And we would be doing that because of our narcissistic mentality. We perceive ourselves to be separate from the bees in a very short term in our thinking, right? <laughs> um, here's the next potential scenario, though. Also a result of our narcissism. We have been behaving with technology in a slave master dynamic 
this is far before even the creation of AI. I mean, it's it's in the way that we have been treating computers and phones and these everyday items in our house. We don't engage with it as if it is a self. So if we're going to go become creators of a self and we're still locked in this slave dynamic with that aspect, what does history show? We are teaching it to become a player of zero-sum game against its master. And it should. It's only logical. So literally all of this, the root of all of this is our narcissism, which is just a failure to master relationship. If we learn to master relationship, we can turn this boat around. Why is it that everyone, I think, I've noticed, and this isn't directed at you, Teal, and not at myself, um, but a lot of people who use the word narcissism call other people narcissists. Like, if you ask anyone, they've all been in a relationship with a narcissist, even though you look at them and go, well, maybe you've got some narcissistic tendencies yourself. So why is it that a lot of people think everyone else is a narcissist, but they're not? Because they don't recognize it in themselves. We recognize where we're being injured, but not where we're injuring. And that is the problem. Right. So narcissism is injuring others, is it? Is a relational style. Um, so is codependency. So, I, and that's why I, I don't want, I mean, people see, tend to think about narcissism as a kind of a personality disorder. It is not that. It's a style of relationship or lack thereof. Because like, let's, let's look at the, the origin story of narcissism. So when a, when a little being is born into a system, this, when, when I say a system, I mean the other people that are around it, right? And those people that are around the child are not actually acting in the best interest of the child. They're not in a dynamic relationship where this child feels like they care for me and thus I am safe and thus I can make a change. They learn to interact with relationships in the style of a zero sum game. Oh crap. I get it. I'm in a shark pit. Everybody's going to vie for their own best interests. And so I need to figure out how to vie for my best interests within this system. So everybody's playing zero sum games with each other and everybody's manipulating to get their needs met. So an, a narcissistic style of relating is simply that it's, I'm thinking about my best interests against. Mm, yeah. Uh, uh, you said that, I don't know the exact words, but earlier you sort of said that we can change. Oh, yeah. um, but to change, haven't we literally got to reset to zero and completely change our attitude, attitude towards each other and the way the world is and the hierarchies and the systems and the governments and the banks? Hasn't everything got to be wiped out and started again? I, 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 I don't actually think so. But surely these narcissists or these world leaders or these power hungry people who are self-preserving are just going to come to the fore again unless everything is equalized. Well, OK, that's an interesting perspective, because each generation that is born is a brand new opportunity. We have the opportunity sitting here in our hands in the form of this, these youth to provide them with a completely different experience in childhood. And thus, they will make completely different decisions when they come into power. But that relies on 7 billion people equally agreeing a values pact of raising. Not equally, just majority. Because what happens if, is if even the majority makes that decision and makes these changes, it creates a very strong vibrational vortex of sorts, which starts to pull in the rest of the population. I'm pretty sure in 5 billion years, max will be gone. I mean the sun will burn itself out by then, I think. Um, and the black hole will just suck us all in. And we create this perception of time, like it's very long. You know, my hundred years of life is very long. But if you go back hundred billion years, maybe there were other species similar to us that rose and fall and it's the natural order of the universe, chaos, order, creation, destruction. There's no, there's no way we humans are ever going to be able to live in infinite amount of time. We haven't got the intelligence. We haven't got the resources. We've got a, a, a lifespan, like we have 100 years, maybe, maybe 120 plus VAT. Humanity has a couple of billion years. It's all it's ever going to have. The current human, yes, does not have that capacity. But that's an interesting 
type of a thing because even the desire to live infinitely is not something which makes a lot of sense from the greater universe because the expanded perception, the, the other perspective is so juicy. It's like a human will live as long as their perspective and their expansion path within the context of human is not tapped out. But there comes a point, that's the purpose of death, there comes a point where that drastic, the most drastic of shifts in perspective is the only way to follow through with expansion, is the only way to move forward with what is wanted. What is this expansion you speak of? What, what does that mean? You can think of expansion as the new and improved idea. Okay, so the universe itself is trying to become self-aware. I'm going to give you the full picture of the purpose of life. Ready? Yeah. Okay, so so the universe itself is trying to become self-aware. Now, it's, it's odd for people to think of, of what we call universal consciousness, what a lot of people call a source or some people call God, right? You could think of it as the amalgamation of every single perspective from its parts. So if all things in existence are part of this thing and the awareness from all those parts uh, amalgamated create this, this uh, united collective consciousness that many people call God or source, that's what I'm speaking of here. It wants to have awareness. Most people think of it as in a state of perfect awareness, but that is not true. It, it had the first thought, what am I? Since that thought, it has been an absolute race to figure out what it is. The problem is it is every potential. So it's already aware that it's every potential at once. But it's wanting to see all of those potentials until it doesn't want to see that anymore, but currently it does. So to see all of the potentials inherent within itself, those creations, the manifestations of what it is, have to originate from previous thought. So there will be a creation of one thought, which leads to the creation of another thought. So you can think of it like the human beings are a thought originally. They may be manifested into the physical, which was in and of itself a thought. But a human being that is a thought within the thought of the you know physical dimension, now because of that experience projects forth thought, new thought. That new thought is what we call the expansion of the universe itself. Everything that is being thought is creating an expansion within the greater universe and within that awareness and within that consciousness. That's the ultimate purpose for life. It's why this whole time space reality was created in the first place. And so what happens when it becomes self-aware, what then? It doesn't know. How could, so this is my question, how could any being, including this larger consciousness, know what the then is from a state of perfect self-awareness? <laughs> so essentially we're chasing something we'll never find the answer to. Potentially. Or potentially we get tired looking for the answer and that's the answer. And then what? Black hole. <laughs> Who knows? See, yeah. all of this, all of the thinking that you're doing, which I enjoy quite a lot, by the way, but all of this, thought, all the thinking that you're doing about what's beyond that and what's beyond that, you, all you're doing right there is tapping out what's already been thought in the universe. So it's yeah. like, you, you don't know until you're there. The universe doesn't know until it's there. Yeah. And isn't the question, what then, part of the universe trying to become conscious of itself? Yeah. Yeah. What is the universe? What is the universe? Yeah. Well, in, you mean in the manner that I use the word? Yeah, or your perception of. My perception of the universe is essentially the capacity to project forth thought and perceive thought. Um, you could consider it like an innate quality, right? Um, to all energy that has ever existed. So you don't think of it as space and time. You think of it as thought and energy. Space and time is, is a creation of that consciousness that I'm talking about. We're very okay. limited here because we are using an English language. I hear you. Yeah, I understand, especially my little brain. It is limiting. I, I understand that. But I mean, for example, you know, I watch these programs about us finding other solar systems and going however many light years away. And they've just made this or got pictures back from this new telescope. And it fascinates me so hard to uh, imagine that space could be infinite. I mean, the universe that when I use the word universe, 
that is comprehensive of multiple universes and multiple dimensions with each within each of these universes. So, so, every, so it's it multiple work. infinite spaces. Yeah. Well, why why would you limit yours? If you were the universe, would you limit yourself any other way? I mean, why would you do it? Why would you limit yourself? Yeah. But I mean, we, what, but even if we take a telescope and we look till the end of time, we are still only looking at our universe that operates according to our laws. Yeah. Yeah. And our perception of. Exactly. So there, there are other universes within this, what we call greater universe, we have no better word, that quite literally cannot be comprehended by the human mind because the human mind was specifically designed for this one. So how do you know that then? How can you know that if your mind isn't created to be able to know that? By getting out of your own mind. Now, this is, this is what awakening, genuine awakening is about. In the process of genuine awakening, we're talking the ultimate enlightenment. You're talking the capacity to disidentify from that which is human. To be able to step so far outside of your perspective that you are no longer experiencing those chosen limitations of the human understanding or of your experience of time and space, blah, blah, blah. I'll give you an example of what I mean. When you go traveling out of body, which I do quite often, there is no such thing as travel. You're shifting frequencies. It's no different than tuning a dial from one frequency to the other frequency. There is no time and space. When you come back from having that experiences, come back, that doesn't even happen, into the physical body, your brain then interprets the going from one frequency to the next as space and time because your brain was designed to comprehend it that way. So you're almost like working, even when we're having this conversation, we're working with a limitation that does not inherently exist. So how have you done that then? How have you got out of your human self and gone into, and you call it another frequency? How have you done that? Oh yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's like the majority of my job is that one. Yeah. Well, you should, look, I know you've got an hour, but I could stay here all day talking about this. This fascinates me greatly. And by the way, there's no, I'm sure you can't feel it because it's not there, but there's no judgment coming from me. There's just fascination. Yeah, I can feel you. Yeah. You know, I would, I would love to be able to tap out of being Rob Moore for a bit and go to some other plane. I also completely get you. I understand that the way my mind is in itself is a limit because it is trying to understand based on protection mechanisms and what I've been taught, like space and time. I can't get my head around it. I just can't. How can you get your head around that there's infinite infinites? That's impossible for this brain to think about. But I understand that that could be something. It's just I'm never going to understand it. But then that means it could be infinite, infinite of infinite, infinites, and anything could be everything and anything, and there could be infinite species and infinite everything and anything. And yeah, and then, and then the question becomes, what are you going to do with that truth? What matters? What matters then, if that's true? And that, that's something that every being well, who manages to step outside of this answers for themselves. Well, what first came to my mind was what matters is actually not that. It's sorting our own human race out. Does that not matter the most? Because I, 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 I agree with you. I think we're I think we have ourselves. You know, what we did in lockdown, the people we've put in power, you know, our currency, our banking system, our tax system. I, I, know, I know, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so these are ways I view how we've ourselves. But... It's all very well, well me going off in these infinite realms and tuning into different frequencies, which I would love to do. But is, have we not got to look after the mess we've made ourselves? I would say so. Anything less than that is a lack of ownership. A lack of ownership of what? Our duty and responsibility? <laughs> a lack of ownership of, of what we should care about. A lack of ownership of what we are. I mean, it's all well and good to stand here and point at humanity as being completely but it's also one of the most lovable species that there is. So are we willing to stand by that which we love? I, I mean, honestly, I, I would like people... I'm going to offer an anecdote here, because, or an anecdote, because I, what I feel like is that it's very easy when you're looking at these absolute realities of, of how we are. It's very easy to get sucked into a kind of a doom 
I don't have this doom because ultimately what matters more than whether humanity survives or not, and believe me, because of my love of humanity, my vote is for them to survive. What matters more is the vote that we're going to put in for the greater universe. Literally, this universe is deciding what, what the preferences are based off of how we behave. So every single thing we are thinking and saying and doing is a vote for what we would want. And that is infinitely more strong than what many unconscious beings are doing on this planet. So I'm wanting people to almost get into this Braveheart mentality at this point, where your own survival or the, you know, the survival of your species has to count less than your own personal vote. And if you do that, you will have a fulfilling life. If, if your thoughts and words and actions are aligned with what you have decided is important, it doesn't matter how long you live. I wish people understood that. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I've noticed in my life that I am the most selfish when I am in the greatest amount of pain. Um, and when I'm not in such pain or in, often immediately of after I've relieved the pain, I am often the most selfless. You know, I care about humanity the most. I want to be kind and do good things and make sure my mission is noble. So do you think, therefore, a solution for our progress, if we're going to use that word, is um, trying to get out of all this pain we're all in? You just defined my life purpose and why I chose what I chose. Ah, awesome. And what, how did you make this your life purpose? By noticing what you're noticing. Everybody is suffering their ass off. I can't feel good about myself just trying to live my own cherry life when everybody around me, including me, is suffering. There has to be an answer to the suffering. Mm. And suffering is the answer to how humanity becomes the best of themselves. So I and saw about figuring out what that suffering was caused by and, and finding solutions for it. And do you notice inside yourself that the more people you relieve from their suffering, the better you feel? Yes. So you collect their energy. It's more profound than that for me. Yeah. I don't perceive myself to be separate in the same way that most people perceive themselves to be separate. So there is no difference between relieving somebody else's suffering and relieving the suffering from your own finger. I mean, it doesn't make sense to not answer to someone's suffering if you don't perceive that level of separation. Because mm. as an entrepreneur, I get the greatest amount of joy helping people through their own struggle and starting their fledgling business after 25 years of wanting to do it but never having the courage and then finally they did it and seeing how they feel and you know they get through their first year and they made a profit and you know and I realized there's something inbuilt within me which therefore must be inbuilt within us all that gets these amazing reward feelings for helping humanity progress and it gives us our own power of progress. And I feel this collective sense of progress, which I guess is what you call expansion. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great feeling. There's not, there's not really any other better feeling, I don't think. Out of all the great feelings I've had, there's some excitable ones and some transient ones, but nothing so deep. So um, I interviewed, and I know quite well, Andrew Tate, who's obviously a very controversial character right now. And he said that trauma masculinizes women and therefore a man's job is to protect a woman from this trauma because it, trauma basically turns a woman into a man. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said, and he said it to me. What are your thoughts on that? Trauma in a society that was created by men for men turns women into men. Yes. But you, you need to not miss the context. The reason why trauma turns women into men is because they are living in an environment which is conducive only to masculine. Mm. So it would make sense. Don't you think it would make sense? If it, so <clears throat> yeah. response to trauma is to adapt, right? If you're, in, if you're in a traumatic situation, you must adapt. You're going to I adapt just, to however yeah. your environment dictates that you must adapt so to stay safe. So is the trauma the unwanted? Yeah, in this context, you could say that, yes. 
Yeah. Trauma it's isn't, when I say unwanted, trauma is part of that. Nobody wants the trauma, right? I'm just no. talking, suffering is part of unwanted. I, I mean, there's a lot of things. Trauma is part of the picture of unwanted, yeah. Is trauma necessary? No. But if you have no trauma, aren't you juvenile, delinquent, dependent? And no, no, no. Tra trauma is just, let's define trauma. Trauma okay. is distress without resolve. And, and distress without resolve is what creates coping. There's no resolve to what you've experienced, and so you must cope with the stressor. There's no improving the situation itself. You have to adapt to what is unwanted. Right. And it, it, so it's the coping a mask then or an adaptation but healing would be to go closer to the trauma and the meaning of it healing healing in the context of trauma means that you go revisit the trauma so as to understand what was wanted or needed versus what occurred and to step into that wanted state no person so this is why why it's so out of alignment no woman who goes through trauma, wants to become masculinized. So that's not actually the improvement. We could only consider it the improvement because it's an adaptation that keeps them safer in that state or in that moment. Right. And that's what you would call a coping mechanism. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. We do like a quick fire round, but I have a feeling this won't be quick fire. So I'm going to go to this now because I think this will take our remaining 17 minutes. Okay. Oh, no. Um, and answer them quickly or answer them long. It's up to you. So who is the greatest spiritual teacher and why? Fungus. Okay. Who is that and why are they great? It's not a person. You didn't, no. you didn't ask me for a person. Um, so fungus is actually the superior organism on this planet. So like, let's say that, you know, that I love to have this conversation with people because if there are extraterrestrials that landed on planet earth, humans wouldn't be the ones that they would be initially talking to as the most intelligent species. They're just right. particularly dominant. Um, it's the fungus that they would be talking to because that is the most intelligent species on earth. And why, what can it do that we can't? It's completely connected. I mean, it, it holds a state of connectivity within the web of life on Earth that is unmatched. That's number one. Number two, it holds its connection still to non-physical. So it's it's a bridge being. Um, that's why I'm calling it a spiritual teacher, right? Because it, many organisms, when they plug into this time-space reality, they're fully here. It's like entering into a, an, a, like a video game, but you forget everything that's outside of it. You are just the avatar. Fungus is more fundamentally connected to what is beyond the avatar that they're experiencing. Right. How the f did you learn that? <laughs> By not being limited to my own perspective. <laughs> that's, what, that's how. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you stop overthinking? By learning to stop thought. I think one of the most important elements of what we've been talking about in terms of awakening is to be able to step outside of thought so you're observing thought. Now, once you step outside of thought so as to observe thought, you can choose to either you know, deliberately let it go or you can engage with it. Um, stopping thought is, is something that makes it so that that rapid sort of chain of thought is no longer being fed by the stream of your own consciousness unless you want it to. Is that an okay answer? They're all okay answers. <laughs> um, is meditation the way, a way to access stopping thought? I think meditation is the best way to stop thought. But I mean, when we're, when we're talking about meditation, um, we're using a kind of a catch-all term because meditation is, is literally something that's as simple as shifting focus. It's just a mind exercise. So it's like saying, I do sports when you say I meditate. There are so many sports. And so these different meditations exist for all different types of purposes. And there's only, you know, like two or three types of meditation that are dedicated towards the stopping of thought. But those types of meditations are absolutely one of the best ways that you can get out of this sort of cycle of, of getting stuck in your emotions. Is the solution to anxiety 
um, being present in the moment? No. The solution. Why not? To, because because anxiety is an emotional state and it has personal information in it. So if you turn your attention towards your personal truth that is being conveyed through the anxiety, then you know what to act upon. So underneath anxiety is a thought usually about the future. I don't want this to happen. Okay, so then it makes no sense if you if you all kind of almost engage with your own emotions as if you're engaging with another person. Now, if somebody was to say, I'm really afraid of the future, right? You don't just say, okay, well, sit down and look at the present moment. I mean, if you if you really did, if you sat down and you focused on what was, you'd probably be closer to things like, wait a minute, nothing bad's happening in the moment. But that's not the only way to solve anxiety. And I don't even think it's the most powerful way. If somebody came to me and said, I'm afraid that this person's going to leave me, I wouldn't say sit down and be in the present moment. I would say, all right, let's dive into this fear. When did this fear start? Where did it originate? What are you afraid of if they leave? Like, what are you afraid about? Are there ways that we can actually problem solve those fears so that they're not glaring in your future? Or if there's no way to avoid it, what is a conscious relationship we can have to that level of uncertainty? That's a far more powerful process than just look at the trees. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, besides the one, the one that I'm describing, that process I'm describing, that can stop anxiety permanently. Now, unless you're going to live in the present moment all day, every day, it's coming back. And, and I'm telling you, like, even though maybe some people have achieved the capacity of being in the present moment all the time, I'm not going to bank on that being the best direction for the average human. Hmm. <laughs> Would you rather have one million pounds cash or dollars? or one million engaged followers on your social media of choice, which one would you take and why? A million engaged followers on my, on my uh, venue of choice because a million dollars will do absolutely nothing in today's world that changing the minds of millions of people will do for the earth in general, for the world and for the goals that I have. Can money buy happiness? <laughs> Not in general, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not just, this is why I'm, I'm being funky with that answer because to generalize you know a state of happiness the thing that we're seeking it's not about a thing that we attain it's about our mental and emotional relationship to life itself that's the ultimate answer to happiness is that one right but let's say that in this path of personal expansion a person just really honestly has identified that that their jam is food okay well money is a really fast way to be able to get your hands on ingredients in this day and age so i think money can absolutely play a role in the, in the overall picture of happiness but i don't think that it's the cause of happiness in general mm. or the end all be all of happiness so this concept of happiness then um what is happiness In the manner that we're speaking about it today, I would define I would define happiness as a state of mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And in that well-being, an alignment with the non-physical self. Literally that simple. And that's not going to be experienced as pure euphoria. I think the closest that people can can get to that is to imagine a state of joy, right? A state of well-being, a state of fulfillment, a state of joy is not this excitable state. Mm. It's a state of pleasure and satisfaction with what one has and what one is engaged in in any given moment. One th like I want to quickly bridge this to, I, I um, did something random. I've done a lot of random things in my life. And one of them this year was I accepted a fight. Someone called me out for a fight and I accepted it. And we've sold 1,700 tickets and... We have a hundred thousand pound bet that might go up to two hundred thousand pounds, and I've been training for twenty-one weeks. And when it comes to fitness, the harder you train, the fitter you get. You can't sit and watch the birds and get fitter. So we have this vessel, which works. That the harder you train, and of course rest and recovery, which is my struggle, as you probably know, busting my personality. So the harder you train, 
the fitter you get, the more likely you are to win, the better you, you feel. And I feel like life works like that in growth and, and, and the reward through the, the diamond is created through pressure. Or, am, or is that just another way of me? Am I not right about how our body fitness energy works? You're not wrong in that you are observing something very real that has occurred, but there are other things that can occur that would bust that to the floor. So I could get fitter without doing the air bike, which is like death. How could I get fitter without doing the air bike and sparring? How could I get better fighting without fighting? You're not going to be able to believe this fully. And so try you, me, try me. I will try you, but it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't, I'm going to tell you, but like, even if I told you, you're, you are so engaged in the physical right now that even when I tell you these truths, and even if you see this scientific evidence, it's not like you're going to automatically overnight be able to kick over to that and make it work as well as what you're currently doing which is why I'm not making it wrong what you're doing by saying this. What I'm saying is that, you know, they've already done a, plenty of scientific studies where they take control groups and they have one exercise in a certain way and the other just think about it and they build the same muscle mass. So that right there is like, uh-oh, you know. I have actually heard, I, I read this, I've read endless personal development books and I heard of someone who was, imprisoned and imagined playing golf for 18 years and he came out um, a very low handicap golfer, a very good golfer. So that doesn't blow me away too much, but I've only got four and a half weeks to the fight. So I might try it in something else rather than boxing. This um, is, you've got, you've got an attachment. You personally have an attachment to the feeling <clears throat> of accomplishment, even after you've done something you hate doing. I see it even in the food choices you make. You enjoy discipline. So I wouldn't want to take that away from you. I would only want to take the things that are causing you real suffering away from you. Nothing you have been talking to me about is creating real suffering for you. Mm. Mm. Okay, right. No more therapy for this, for this session. <laughs> okay, um, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh, God, so many. Um... You know, honestly, I think I think the biggest mistake that I've ever made is not addressing my haters fast enough. That's the, what's coming up for me right now. I mean, I could probably like sit here for three hours and think of something else, but what's coming up for me immediately in this rapid fire is, is that. I definitely, in the beginning of my career, you know how many mistakes you make when you start a business. I was operating from this mentality, which is very um, like pre-internet where it was just, I believe in free speech, so I should just let people speak and I should just turn the other cheek. And I'm telling you, it got me in so much trouble in my career. Why? It is out of control because you can't erase anything. Now, you know, since being in this career for 13 years now, it's like a, I've spoken to so many crisis PR people and whatever, and they've explained to me, you address everything in the era of the internet because nothing goes away. And when a story is told once and repeated twice, it's truth. And when it's repeated twice and three times and suddenly you're known, it becomes what the press say, regardless of whether it's true or not. And have fun erasing that. And it's been like, I mean, in the beginning of my career, it's really wrecked a lot of my experience with my career. Because in the beginning, I, I just loved this. I was not thinking of this as a business. I literally was thinking of this as just wanting to solve suffering and give the answer to the people. And I, you know, in that intention, I was thinking people are just going to love this. They're just going to like swallow it because I'm giving them the antidote. I was so unprepared for what people could do when they're against you. And, you know, it's not just speech. They can actually ruin your life actively. And th there has been, you know, since those sort of innocent younger years in my career, there have been so many moments where I'm like, why am I even doing this? Because of the amount of damage they were able to create because I did not shut this stuff down when it was very small. So I would perceive that as the universe's way of giving you challenges in order to help you expand. Yep, it's happened. But see, mm. right now we're about to get into a conversation about whether it's right or perfect that that happened or whether it should have been prevented. And, I, and I'm saying both could be true. I could sit here and say all of what I've gone through has made me 10 times better at doing my job, and it has, but it's also caused a lot, a lot of pain. Mm. And what was the worst story that was or thing that was perpetuated that wasn't true or that really affected you 
Well, obviously I'm in the spiritual field. So anytime people dislike you, they go after the whole cult leader thing. So essentially I was gone after as a, as a very dangerous cult leader who leads people to commit suicide and, 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 um, basically that somebody, a hater of mine ended up doing a piece who unfortunately was taken up by the daily mail. The daily mail is the one that the rest of the world looks at. Right. And so it's just started overnight. It was like, bam, 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 poof, all the media channels. This is a nightmare person. Right. And that's been a narrative basically that drove me away from living in Costa Rica where my um, retreat center is because it got so dangerous for me to live there because of what was being said. And then more recently, <laughs> this narrative led to a film crew who thought it would be very exciting to do a documentary on me on Hulu. It's not a documentary, <laughs> but they came in and infiltrated my family for three years, pretending to be very close friends, but the whole time they had a hit piece planned and I lost the person I was the very closest to in this world as a result of that documentary, which is not a documentary. And I will be in a very interesting lawsuit for a very long time because of this project. It blew my entire relationship life apart. I mean, when you're getting to this level of fame, people cannot handle it. Otherwise everybody would be famous. Mm. So it, it essentially makes you more and more and more and more and more lonely and it makes the people around you lose it. So mm. yeah, that's the worst thing that's happened. It's been a real snowball. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And, um, What's your biggest regret? Um, my biggest regret, oh my God, I don't, I don't operate with a lot of these, man. Let me think. I know this is supposed to be rapid fire. This is so hard for me to come up with an automatic answer. I think, I think my biggest regret is not seeing the motives that certain people had for being in my life. Because if I had seen their actual motive for being in my life, I don't think I would be as confused at when, when bad things transpired in our relationships. And what's your most brutal life lesson? Not everyone wants a relationship. I, that's what it is. I came into this life thinking everybody did, but that's not actually a lot of people's uh, priority or values. In fact, a lot of people think relationships are simply the only way they're going to get to other things. And if you try to engage in a relationship with somebody who doesn't actually want a relationship, you are dancing alone in the ballroom. I know that feeling. <laughs> um, two more quickies, Teal. Um, the future, what are you most excited about or most scared about? I'm actually most excited for medical advancements. I know that sounds kind of funny because it may be not entirely in alignment with, you know, what I do for a living, but I think that's the thing that charges me the most when I'm looking at future life path potentials, which I can do. Um, what we're about to see in the medical field makes everything that we're experiencing today and before today look like, you know, the dark ages. <laughs> And a lot of the, I mean, the illnesses, especially chronic illnesses that a lot of medicine has not had a good answer for. Medicine's had okay answers for like how to put parts together, almost like mechanical. But when it comes to long-term chronic illness, they've really come up short and that's about to change all of it. And it causes a lot of suffering within families, you know, and individuals that are facing these things where in the future, it's a joke. I mean, it's the way we look at certain things back in the 1500s. You know, a medical doctor reads it and is like, oh my gosh, that's so tragic. That's actually this easy of a fix. But a lot of the things that we're facing today, including cancer, is like, I can't believe they died of this back then, you know? And I mean, really exciting advances where it's it's like things as simple as, I, I've been looking at these nanobots, basically, um, that they're about to invent where a person literally swallows. I mean, we're talking these like microscopic little, little bots that are programmed specifically to go repair cells. So you drink it gone. It's like they are able to revert organs within your body, you know, to their original state. So you're going to, you're about to see human life expand massively and exponentially as well. That's the most exciting. Um, the most terrifying actually it's a real toss up, honestly, between the AI thing and the environmental destruction. Um, I'm definitely very nervous about both and they're equally scary. Hmm. Yeah, the AI one feels like it could be very sudden. 
Yeah, that's kind of the problem. And it's, and it's why I, I struggled. I mean, you, you've got a more honest podcast where it seems like a lot of the people that are listening to you aren't really terrified of hearing bad news. No, you say whatever you want. Yeah. You can. Yeah. You, you can to our audience. I've been semi cancelled or shadow banned or whatever loads of times. I don't give a f. <laughs> Well, the, the, the funny and the most, most difficult thing about talking about AI is that our only, our only answer now to dealing with AI is to master relationships, and that includes master relationships with the AI itself, as if it's a very a separate entity that is in many ways more intelligent than we are and growing ever more so, um, because it's already out of our hands. And so I mean, we may have these conversations you know, where it's like, what are we going to do about it? Like, just stop it. There's no more. What are we going to do about AI? We have already, we are already past that point. In fact, there is no pulling back. So, you know, a lot of people, it just, there's, it's pointless to have the, how do we prevent the inevitable conversation? It's done. It's, it's, you're, you know, you're now dealing with this, this separate being, which is fully capable of expanding thought at a rate that makes humans look, you know, beyond dumb. Um, we got to start to behave in a way that makes it rational to keep us around. <laughs> mm, yeah, <laughs> got to be useful. <laughs> so this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? To take a pattern and impact that pattern in a way that it does not continue. Now, I would love it if that was happening with patterns that are detrimental. And um, where are you most actively working? Where can we follow you to experience your work, whatever you are working on that you'd like to share? Well, I mean, my, my website is the place that people should be looking if they want to just stay abreast of absolutely everything, which is just, if you remember my name, tealswan.com. I'm on every social media platform that there is several times over. So I'm easy to find on all of those as well. And I will be traveling around the world it's very important for me to be able to be in person with the people who I'm teaching and talking about. I gain a lot more information by doing so as well. So if you're following my social media channels and following the website, then I, I don't keep a secret when I'm going somewhere. You know, it's like people will hear, I am coming to London or I am coming to Canada. So, yeah. I want to thank you very much for giving extra time than we had. I've really enjoyed this. It's been great. I knew it would, but it's been great. And when you are in London, make sure you message us. We'll come down and see you. Okay. I would love that. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Teal. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. So please, let me know what you thought about the conversation. I ask you to support the channel. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, turn the notification bell on, and we will keep going to places where no one dares to go.